to start in Girona. Well, so, you know, recording that uh, she went to the United States for postdocs and came back to Girona. And since then, she has been collecting, you could say, all the prices of, of young researchers. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Sylvia. And we're uh, looking to score more our impacts. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Victor, for the invitation. It's very, it's great to be here. Yeah, in person because uh, last year, unfortunately, I uh, we yeah I could not come. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to share with you the research that we are doing um, in computational enzyme design. Um, and I'd like to start with the example. I think this this is like the example that changed the the biocatalysis uh, field. Um, and yeah, the drug here that you see is citagliptin phosphate. That is a drug that is uh, used to type uh, to treat type two uh, diabetes. And the way this this drug uh, was synthesized was um, from oh, from the corresponding D ketone. Um, and they use a rhodium catalyst that required high pressures and several purification steps to finally get the chiral amine in uh, in ninety seven percent of uh, excess and antimatic of antimatic excess. Um, however, this whole route was mm, replaced by an enzyme, by a transaminase, and this transaminase was operating on yeah, low pressure, no treatment for purification, and was providing the chiolamine in 99.95% yeah, EE. So the whole route was yeah, operating under very mild conditions, was efficient, specific, selective, and so that's uh, one of the yeah, nice examples of how enzymes or, or, or the power of biocatalysis. What I did not say is that this transaminase is not natural. Um, instead, it had to be designed to actually uh, yeah, accept such a bulky uh, D-ketone. And in terms of design, uh, we have different strategies, as you know. Um, and of course, the most um, yeah, powerful technique and the most famous one is didactic evolution that was recognized with a Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 2018. Um, and this area evolution uh, technique is able to provide highly efficient variants, um, but it has a high cost associated and also the disadvantage that it's non-rational. So at the end, so you spend a lot of money to evolve an enzyme and at the end, you don't know why the enzyme is working. So this knowledge cannot be applied for other uh, design campaigns. Um, and also you need weeks and months of yeah, experiments. Computational approaches yeah, offer the advantage you know, of being rational. So in principle, we can predict mutations uh, to enhance the, the enzyme property that we are interested. Um, and they are yeah, much, uh, much more, uh, much cheaper um, and they are rational. But in any case, we need months also of simulations many times to just design uh, yeah, proposed mutations for, for a given enzyme. Um, and in any case, so either with the evolution or computational approaches, uh, natural enzymes. So here, what I'm showing in this um, in this line with these different dots are the catalytic efficiencies of some, in this case, uh, aldolases, retroaldolases. Um, so natural enzymes are like there, and with directed evolution and com especially with computational approaches, yeah, we're very far away from yeah such uh, excellent um, efficiencies. Um, and of course, as a dream, uh, we would like you not know, to to well, design computationally very efficient enzymes in why not just hours or yeah um, or or days, but of course we are not there uh, yet. Um, and well, why I think it's so challenging, no? So well, and why it's so challenging? Um, well, I like to yeah remind yeah remind how complex is enzyme catalysis. So. The enzyme um, has an active site that, that is completely reorganized, has all the catalytic residues in place to stabilize the multiple transition states um, that take place along the catalytic itinerary. And here I'm showing you know, an example of a complex mechanistic, um, mechanism of an enzyme tryptophan synthase that I'll be also discussing. Um, and of course, if one computationally wants to study all these chemical steps and study the reaction mechanism, so we need to rely on, on quantum mechanics or hybrid no? quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics um, techniques. But the enzyme is not just a pre-organized active site. So the enzyme also changes conformation, um, as you know, no? and the enzyme so adopt many different conformations. And at the end, all of those are very important for the function of this enzyme. 
And of course, these conformational changes um, can have a very big impact into the tunnels, for example, so that it will uh, affect the substrate binding or the product release. Um, and in many cases, in, in, well, in some cases, here I'm showing, um, well, so this is the free energy landscape that represents this ensemble of conformations and the relative stabilities of these different conformations and also how uh, different are the barriers connecting those different states. Um, and uh, again, I'm showing here like a stack of different free energies uh, of an enzyme tryptophan synthase that changes the conformation of a, of a given uh, lead that covers the active site. And this has different conformation depending on the, the intermediate, the reaction intermediate. So at the end, if one wants to design highly efficient enzymes, needs to take into account this pre-organization you know, of, the, of the active site pocket, but also, um, yeah, take into account this ensemble of conformations. Um, then, of course, we have the problem with the large sequence space. So yeah, even for a very small protein of just 100 uh, residues, the potential number of, of, of sequences is very, very large. So how we can reduce this number? How can we uh, identify which positions need to be changed for enhancing the, the, the property that we are interested in? No? And mostly, People, I mean, of course, the obvious, no, is to if the catalysis takes place in the active site, one would assume that yeah, by introducing mutations in the active site it would be uh, enough. Um, but um, we have seen with many years of directed evolution that in many cases, well, mutations far away from the active site are introduced, and actually these mutations, these still mutations, have an impact into the the KCAT into the the enzyme catalytic activity. So here I just put some examples of different um, different uh, directed evolution campaigns in which they um, uh, introduce mutations, and mo most of them are quite far away from from the active site, um, which is nice. So in a way, it's telling us you know, that the the proteins have this elastic uh, communication, and that distal sites in a way can impact all the way the yeah the catalytic uh, pocket. And also, of course, related to the first point is that, okay, so we don't have the same. So uh, if we're interested in studying the the, yeah, the the chemical steps, we need to rely on, on quantum mechanics or, or hybrid uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. If we're interested in conformational dynamics, we need to rely on uh, yeah, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo. So we, really there is no general tool. So we need to combine different tools and that's how we approach uh, computational and, and design. <laughs> And this means that sometimes doing the ranking of the variants, an accurate ranking and, and a fast ranking is not that easy. Okay, so the way we try to do um, enzyme design is, uh, so our main focus along these years has been on a lot on the conformational dynamics. So our idea is to um, get information about the enzyme, well, the, the different conformations that the enzyme can adopt and then, um, in a way, treat this computational enzyme design as a population shift problem. So here we identify different conformations. We can further character characterize each one of those conformations and identify the one we think is important for enhancing, I don't know, promiscuous reactivity or for uh, accepting um, the other substrates or, or for the new uh, um, activity that, that we want to uh, introduce. And the idea would be to try to stabilize this com the conformation that we think are, are, are more important for this um, uh, additional uh, activity. And the question is, okay, so which mutations, so which positions we need to introduce? Uh, and as I said before, ideally, we would like not to just focus on the active side, but also identify these two sites. Um, and in this way, well, in this line, so we uh, we develop uh, um, this uh, short path map tool in which, well, so we do this, uh, this uh, molecular dynamic simulations. We get information about correlated movements between the residues that compose the protein. Um, and we can translate that into a graph. We uh, have like, like the one shown in here. So this kind of a strategy, so this graph, basically each, uh, sphere is a residue, and then you have lines connecting the different residues. And these lines, the length of this line is weighted according to the correlation, yeah, the correlation between the, the pairs of residues uh, that are um, yeah, connected. 
And this kind of a strategy were used for studying allosteric, uh, allosteric systems. So people, um, yeah, generate this complex graph, and then these graphs were further simplified by identifying communities within this graph. Um, and so to understand how you know how the this this allosteric communication takes place between different uh, subunits. But the idea. Um, here is that we are not interested in communities, instead we are interested in residues or in positions. So then uh, this graph, we further simplify it and we detect which are the, yeah, the, the edges that are shorter, so that are more correlated. Um, and in this way, you can have this SPM that can be plotted back into the 3D structure. And then when you do so, you have an idea of how the active side of the enzyme is connected to more distal sites. Okay, so we did that, um, and uh, and we applied first to understand and, and try to understand how well compare it with directed evolution. No, um, so we had we applied in different systems in which we have information about, yeah, um, how well at least positions that directed evolution targeted, and then we compare those positions with the ones we identified with our SPM, and realize that well, I mean many of those are we identify it, and if not, they are like making interactions with residues contained in the in the in the path. Also we apply it for a lost theory, so for studying the communication between subunits within the yeah, same end, well like in the case of monomine and uh, monomine oxidases, so between the two monomers, but also uh, in the case of uh, uh, AGPA that it's um, uh, homo uh, heterodimer, sorry. Uh, but in this case what I would like to show you is how we are now using this tool to design. Okay. Um, and in this regard, so I'd like to explain you two different projects. Um, and um, well, the first one um, is this one that uh, Guillem has been in, uh, involved uh, um, yeah, all the time, and also uh, Javi uh, Iglesias was uh, is also involved. Um, and um, and this project, so it's basically trying to make a hydroxy nitrile lyase uh, into convert it into a good esterase an efficient esterase. And uh, well, um, all the experimental values that I'm going to show, uh, these have been done by the uh, Kauslaskas lab, the University of uh, Minnesota. And more recently, the Sternel lab also joined um, the efforts in uh, yeah, the University of Regensburg. Okay, so, so the, these enzymes that we are interested in making this conversion are contained in this alpha beta hydrolyte bulk. <laughs> That is a fault that it has been widely studied because it contains many different uh, reaction types. Well, it contains esterases, lipases, oxidoreductases, et cetera. And this enzyme has been used as a model. Um, and also the important part is that, well, 75% contain the same catalytic triad. So this serine, histidine, aspartate, or glutamate. Okay. So they share the same catalytic uh, triad, but still they catalyze different uh, reactions. Um, and as I said, so our idea here was to take, well, these two enzymes, um, so um, this hydroxy nitrile IAs from, from uh, rubber tree, um, and try to make it a good esterase. And the esterase that we took it as reference was this from uh, from tobacco, so sub, uh, yeah, sub B2. And by comparing, I said, no, we don't want to restrict ourselves to the active site. But of course, the obvious step, the first step, is to check the active site and see how these different, how these enzymes differ. And if you do so well, as I said, the catalytic triad is exactly the same, so they they share, have the same, but there are some differences. In the case of the um, uh, hydroxy nitrile ligase, there is this uh, this polar side that it's uh, in charge of stabilizing um, the negative uh, charge on the on the nitrogen of the cyanohydrin. Um, and this polar side in the esterase is actually a hydrophobic side. Okay. So uh, and the, so it has a histidine, not shown in here, um, but it's uh, this histidine um, uh, is there to stabilize the, the alcohol product. And then the most important, or yeah, uh, very important difference between these two enzymes is the uh, oxyanion hull. So <clears throat> the esterase has basically uh, an alanine um, and this um, leucine 
that uh, are there actually to stabilize and activate um, well the, the carboxylic oxygen. And this is missing in HNL. So in HNL instead, it has this uh, this threonine uh, 10 that, well, so the hydroxyl group, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's making this interaction with, uh, uh, with the substrate. <laughs> okay, so in our design goal to try to take the, to make the HNL a good esterase, we started by, yeah, just doing the obvious mutation. So yeah, change the polar side for the hydrophobic side and try to take over or to uh, introduce an oxygenine uh, uh, hole. And why, I don't know why this is here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so by doing so well, the Kauslaska lab uh, provides us with the, with the kinetic data. So here I'm showing the values of the K cut of a KM. Um, this is the HNL. Uh, this is the reference enzyme that has like 60,000. And just by introducing these three obvious mutations, well, yeah, we increase a little bit, but not that great. Okay, so it's obviously, it's obvious that we need more than this, uh, yeah, uh, obvious mutations, no? Um, and so then we decided to apply it our methodology, to uh, identify these, uh, re these yeah, paths of connected residues, correlated uh, residues. And here what I'm showing is, well, the, SPM of the esterase, that is our reference enzyme, and the SPM of our uh, of the HNL three B. Okay, so the HNL that already has the three mutations, um, and you see, um, well, in the you see now uh, spheres and boxes. So basically, the boxes are those positions that are not conserved between sub P two and HNL. So positions that we identify with the shortest that are not conserved, and the spheres are the ones that are actually so concerned. They have exactly the same amino acid at these positions. Um, well, we decided to focus on two different regions. Well, first, very important. So these are the oxygen ion whole residues. Um, and you can see that in the case of SAPI2, the asterisk, there is a direct connection between these two. So the, the conformation of this oxygen ion of this alanine is connecting to this, uh, to this leucine. And also there is a connection between this serine 179. And if you check that in the HNL3B, well, this is missing. So the um, the oxygen ion, the, yeah, the potential oxygen ion residue, it's not connected to position um, 82, okay? And also the connection between this uh, residue and position 176 here is not direct. So it's through this, uh, yeah, this conserved point here. So we decided that one potential, well, two potential mutations could be, well, this serine and, and this uh, leucine here. Uh, and then the other difference uh, that we saw is that, okay, so these are the catalytic residues, the, yeah, the serine, the histidine, and the aspartate. And you see that all these residues are all connect, uh, connected through this uh, strand here. So this region here, this loop here, sorry. Um, and so we decided that probably trying to yeah, remove such connection, which is actually missing in SAP2, could also be useful for enhancing the, the enzyme, uh, well, the esterase activity. So this basically uh, leads us to, well, um, eight mutations. So, so basically the three mutations that we already introduced plus four or plus five, um, well, fly, five, all, 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 all of them that we identified. And four, well, we decided to, to, to ask them to try the seven and the seven T. Um, basically, we also did a multiple sequence alignment and realized that the amino acid that SAP2 has, in the case of these two, it's exactly the same as the most frequently observed. However, in this case, in 104, uh, SAP2 had an alanine, whereas uh, the most frequently observed was this threonine. So we decided to try, okay, let's try HNL7 and HNL7T. Okay? So instead of an alanine, putting a threonine. Okay, so we we, we, we asked them to, to try and they, they did. And so what I'm showing here now is the values of these variants uh, of, in terms of K-cat over KM. So basically seven and eight, have very similar K-cut of a KM. We enhance the activity like 300-fold. 
Uh, but but in, uh, yeah, much more drastically, if this uh, position 104, we introduce a, a threonin, then we have like uh, even yeah, higher activity than the reference uh, sub-P2 uh, enzyme. So the enhancement um, was uh, more than 1,000 1, uh, fold. Um, and actually, we uh, of course we computationally evaluated, so we, we try to see how I mean why no uh, why there is uh, such an improvement and how uh, this is working, um, and we realized that okay, so the variance if you look at how the oxyanion whole residues are positioned, well the the variants that have much higher esterase activity have the oxyanion whole properly uh, positioned. So here the overlay. Um, yeah, it's so sub P2 uh, is also included in this overlay, and uh, and basically yeah, so all the the amides are now correctly pointing to the same direction as sub P2. However, in the worst variants, well, you see this distance is much longer, uh, and this can also be seen if you just plot the histogram of uh, that distance, and you see well the bad ones have uh, uh, sorry the good ones have. Uh, Shorter distance, the bad ones have uh, much longer. And also, um, the interesting part is that okay, so with with this with this uh, tool, we identify correlated movements. So in a way, uh, we are like identifying so, so positions that work together, no? that are act synergistically. And and so we also um, try to well to evaluate. Um, the combination of those and see how uh, the, by combining those uh, we could well enhance the, the the enzyme activity. And so again, I'm showing here an overlay. Well, that's the the three B, so overlay to sub P two, and you see that well there is a major deviation on, on the on the oxygen ion uh, hole position. Um, what I'm showing here is the K cut of a KM, okay, so the experimental value. Um, and while well, by introducing just this position, while well, the oxygen ion um, hole is a little bit more well positioned, so in yeah in line with the hierarchy cut of KM. Um, also, we see in the case of the single mutant that okay, so there is a a change in the conformation of this of this um, uh, side chain, uh, which yeah you know. Uh, disrupts or affects the binding of, of the substrate. Um, and here is this, um, yeah, the, this other single variant that again, uh, uh, yeah, um, helps positioning the side chain in the proper place so that the substrate can bind. And by combining all of them, well, you see that uh, uh, there is, so this is the sum of the individual contributions that is all this extra, so there is this positive epistasis. So by combining all these positions that we identify with the SPM, yeah, all of them act together and enhance uh, the enzyme activity. So it's nice for studying these epistatic effects. <clears throat> okay, what I did not tell you, so I, I show you the KCAT of AKM, uh, which we were very happy to see that uh, that was improved. However, if you check more specifically KCAT, uh, if that's what I'm showing here, well, the problem we have is that, uh, well, uh, KCAT, I mean, we are, it's not as good as uh, SAPI2. Okay, so we are not at this uh, 130, um, yeah, minus, minus, minus one. Um, so still, yeah, we would like to break more mutations to try to, yeah, enhance the KCAT uh, uh, better. So we enhance all of the KM, um, uh, and ideally we would like to, boost also the KCAT and we are working on it and we uh, of course we identify more positions with the SPM so the idea is now to well to try to well we ask them to try uh, other positions that are non-conserved and that all the way connected to the catalytic uh, residues okay and the other story that I'd like to show you that uh, um, some of these some of of this I already explained to you uh, like one year ago, but yeah, it will be different, <laughs> um, a little bit different. And this is the project that Christina uh, Duran is, is doing. Um, and here, well, uh, yeah, previously, Javi uh, was involved and also uh, Miguel Angel. And this project is a very nice uh, collaboration with the Sterner Lab at the University of Um 
Okay, so tryptophan synthase, I already explained you, uh, introduced you this enzyme in the introduction. So uh, this is an enzyme that is composed by two subunits, the alpha and the beta. Here you have the overall reaction. Um, um, and, uh, and basically uh, having a standalone versions of, uh, especially the beta, but also the alpha, would be interesting for the industrial synthesis of, uh, of uh, L-tryptophan derivatives or indole derivatives. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, the the point is that, well, this enzyme is an allosterically regulated enzyme. So basically the alpha without the beta does not work efficiently and, and vice versa. So um, yeah, we would like to predict mutations to try to make these enzymes standalone, no? but they don't. So remove this requirement, this, this dependency on the binding partner. Um, and yeah, and I said that this project is done in collaboration with the Sterner Lab because, uh, well, they have a, a lot of experience in, in this type of system, but also we saw that they published this paper uh, in PNAS in which they uh, reconstructed the last bacterial common ancestral uh, tryptophan synthase. Um, and also, yeah, all these ancestral enzymes all the way to the more modern ones. And they realized that the ancestral enzyme, at least the beta, was a standalone. However, this enzyme along the course of evolution, well, uh, was changed. And so uh, at certain point, the beta had or, or required the presence, the presence of alpha to operate, uh, well, to, to function, hmm? to have a standard, to have activity. Um, and the modern ones or uh, betas have this dependency on the alpha. This is not the story for, for the alpha subunit. So the alpha in the ancestral enzyme was already dependent on beta, okay? So in our attempts to try to make a standalone alphas, and in the case of alpha, yeah, we didn't have a real uh, reference because the, the ancestral enzyme was already, um, yeah, uh, dependent on, on, the, on the beta. But interestingly, there is a, a paralog of, uh, of uh, tryptophan A from the secondary me uh, metabolism of ZMIs uh, this ZMIs BX1 that if you see, well, this, uh, I overlay the structure of ZMIs BX1 with the structure of LBCA uh, tryptophan A. And you see that structurally they're exactly the same. The sequence identity is quite low, uh, but ZMIs BX1 has standalone activity, whereas LBCA tryptophan A not. Um, so we decided to, yeah, so let's try, let's take LBCA tryptophan A and ZMIs BX1, explore them, and try to enhance the standalone activity of the of the uh, ancestral alpha. Um, we check also the uh, yeah of course the the available structures, um, and interestingly both for LBCA well oh, sorry both for tryptophan for the alpha subunit uh, and BX one we saw that there is a loop loop six that. The crystals already show that can have like two different conformations and these different um, Mm, conformations of the loop affect also the positioning of a of a residue that uh, yeah phenylalanine that then gets into the active site. So yeah, so in a way, this telling us that this loop six conformation is important uh, uh, for yeah the opening and the closing might be important for the for the enzyme uh, activity. And <clears throat> here, what I'm showing is the, uh, okay, so. Um, we, we analyzed no, how this loop six uh, was opening in the case of LBCA, the ancestral enzyme, and in the case of VX1. And what we realized is that, okay, so the, the, the landscape looked very, very different. Uh, in, LB, in VX1, no, the loop can actually close and open. And uh, also this phenylalanine can have the, these two stages with closer to the active site and, and, and far away from the active site. So this, uh, and L in LBCA, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there is no productive closing of the of loop six. So we think this is the, the main point of why uh, LBCA tryptophan A cannot really uh, function. So it has a low activity because the loop, it's not able to properly uh, close. Um, again, we did the SPMs. And we compare the SPMs um, uh, of the uh, ancestral enzyme and BX1, and we saw very well uh, many differences. First one is that in BX1, well, the whole loop six is actually 
well, almost the whole almost whole loop six is recognizing the SPM. So these all of these are yeah positions that are conformationally relevant, and there is a di direct connection with the loop two. The loop two is important because it has a catalytic residue. Um, and this is kind of I mean kind of missing in in LBCA. So there are yeah there is some of the positions are identified, but not. Uh, as in the case of the H1, and of course there is no such connection with uh, with the loop, the loop two. And also, um, well, in terms of the active site core, let's say or the core of the protein, um, VX1 has a much more order and much more well connected, uh, uh, yeah, uh, structure. So by compare again, okay, I'm not, I do not have the boxes, but by comparing the sequences, we decided to focus. To, well, to generate two, mm, two different variants. One that we call SPM7, in which mutations only in the, in the the more in the core are, are introduced. And then the variant that we call it loop six, in which, yeah, the positions are, that we identify in the loop six are uh, transferred, let's say. Um, and well, so we also evaluated uh, yeah, how these variants, yeah, before telling them to try, <laughs> How they look in the in the simulations, and we saw that well. Um, of course, the shapes are not as in the case of the H1, but uh, especially by combining the seven mutations plus the loop, uh, was providing like uh, well again uh, uh, like similar shape, no, with the two minimas and uh, loop six looks like it's more able to to uh, to close. And well, and actually they tried and. Um, and here I'm showing also the KCAT of AKM. Um, seven and six have very sim similar KCATs. So this is KCATs, okay. Um, similar KCATs, but yeah, we enhance it like seven uh, fold. Um, and uh, by combining them, then the improvement was much, much higher, uh, 65. And of course we are not there yet, but yeah, uh, we were happy with the improvement um, that we obtained. Also, I, I also wanted to, to show you that, okay, so in complex, no, LBCA, uh, so the alpha in complex, the value for KCAT is the one shown in there. Um, so yeah, uh, really our variant is much better than the, than the alpha in complex. And also uh, I'm showing here now KCAT of AKM, the, um, the improvement is kind of similar in terms of KCAT of AKM. Um, we have we do have a problem with uh with the KMs in this case that we are trying to solve. Um but yeah, I also put here the, the value of uh the alpha in complex so that we have an idea. So yeah, we surpass a little bit the the value of the of the and uh now we are trying to make this uh to improve the KMs even better. And we think the problem here is that I did not tell you, I did not uh uh, explain you that, but uh, VX1 is actually a dime, okay? And and LBCA tryptophan A is a monomer. So, and we, from the kinetic data, we know that by doing the complex, so uh, at least the alpha with the beta in complex, the KM is much better. So now we are like trying to make our LBCA tryptophan A, or our, our SPM7 loop six, try to make it a dime, okay? But still working on it, so. Uh, yeah, which hopefully will enhance the KM. Okay, and then the last, and this is something that I all, yeah, um, I explained you uh, about this project like last year. Um, and actually I explained the story in this way, but this was the first exam. So the first uh, study where we tried to make um, uh, a standalone tryptophan uh, synthase B, B was the first one, okay. Um, and our inspiration was, well, here you have the enzyme. This is where, well, it's a PLP dependent enzyme. Uh, and this is where the active site is. And this enzyme has a lead, a com domain that covers the active site. And this, uh, it can adopt like different conformations, no open, close, and partially close. Um, and this is interesting, and I'll show you uh, uh, why. Um, and the story here is that our first attempt was to try to understand directed evolution. So uh, the Arnold lab applied directed evolution in this case in the beta, and they come up with a variant that they call it zero B2, in which mutations were introduced 
um, seven mutations, and these mutations were not in the active site and were not in the com domain either. Okay, so we're like this though. So we started by trying to understand uh, what these distal mutations are doing. Um, and basically, well, I'm just showing the stack of, of the different uh, free energy landscape that we reconstructed for uh, the beta in complex, the beta isolated, but the wild type, and the beta with a mutation, so the 0B2. And by, well, by comparing those cells, we realized that the, the, the distal mutations, what are doing is that they are enhancing this conformational heterogeneity of the system. So now the system can adopt the com domain, can adopt the open, yeah, the open, the partially closed, and the closed conformations, which in the absence of the distal mutations was not. Um, and also the mutations uh, allow the enzyme to adopt this productively closed and catalytically relevant uh, closed conformation of the com domain. Okay. Um, and again, we applied the SPM and we saw that some of the positions that directed evolution targeted were, in, were included in the path. And if not, yeah, we're making interactions with residues um, and mutations were making interactions with residues of the path. And this led us to try to design a standalone version of the beta. And we took as a, as a scaffold, this ancestral enzyme. So this is the first ancestral enzyme, the ANC3, that um, well, the external lab, um, yeah, uh, identified and that found that it was the first one that had dependency on 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 alpha. And again, we applied our methodology. We applied the shortest path map. We compare you know, the for each one of those positions uh, whether it was conserved or not between LBCA and our scaffold. Uh, and if we're not compared, I were not uh, conserved, then we introduced that mutation, and that led us to SPM. Six uh, that has these mutations, many of them far away, except one that it's much closer to the where the PLP is. Um, and well, and they, they, yeah, they generated the variant. And well, we improved the the KCAT uh, eightfold, which we were happy because okay, in the evolution they improved it ninefold and had to generate and screen more than three thousand variants. Um, so we were, that was the start of the, of the story and we were happy um, at that point. And also the thing that we were not expecting is that, okay, so we assume that by enhancing the standalone activity of the beta, uh, we assume that then in the presence of alpha, the activity would be worst. But actually this was not the case. So this beta is still activated by alpha and actually it's, uh, yeah, in complex, it's, it's better than, yeah, than LBCA standalone or the ancestral three in complex. <clears throat> and of course, yeah, this is, well, nice, but we have a lot of challenges, no? And uh, in all the cases that I have shown you, we have a reference. Yeah. We have a reference and inspiration. So why do we don't have that inspiration? Um, and the problem we have is that, well, we, we identified a lot of positions, like 20% of the, <clears throat> the mutation of the positions. And then the other thing is that, okay, so really um, reconstruct, obviously doing all these simulations to reconstruct and have an idea of the conformational heterogeneity of the systems is quite expensive. Um, and so in that point, we, yeah, we ask ourselves whether we could use alpha fold, no? So that really has changed our, yeah, <laughs> our life, no? Um, so whether we can use alpha fold and try to estimate the conformational heterogeneity without the need of such long MD. And this is what uh, we did. Okay, we apply it in these systems in which we have a lot of information. Um, so what I'm showing here in gray, these are the, well, the free energy landscape that I showed you before. Uh, and on top of it, well, and you see here yeah, different vertical lines uh, with different colors. <laughs> okay, so each one of these vertical lines is an alpha fall uh, prediction in which we generated, I sorry, we changed the number of sequences provided. So the MSA depth, uh, we use from as low as 32 to up to 5,000. And that's what the different, the colors of the lines uh, of the line mean. And then it's one of those, uh, yeah, you see that we could actually get a structure with open, partially closed and closed conformation of the common domain. 
We did that for ZW2, LBCA, and SPM6. Uh, and then from this, each one of these off of all, then we run short MD, like 10 nanoseconds MD. And we, yeah, to, hide, to, to check whether we could have an idea of which of the systems are like more conformationally uh, rich, let's say. Um, and yeah, we were happy that even with just very yeah, short MD, we were able to have uh, like get the same information. Zero B2 has a much higher confirmation heterogeneity and it's better in closing the COM. So it's uh, in adopting the productively closed confirmation of the COM. And the other point um, that we are also uh, checking is okay. So whether, I mean, so just, yeah, we can take these uh, short MDs and, and construct our SPM and overlay it with the SPM that we did uh, with the metadynamic simulations. And uh, well, we were happy to see that, well, I mean, they look pretty much the same. So, and many of the positions that we identified in the case of SPM6, uh, well, five of them, we would identify by using this, uh, yeah, this SPM from, yeah, the combination of alpha fold and, and short MD. So we just, well, it's nice because uh, maybe, you know, we can use, uh, well, instead of doing a lot of MDs or months of composition, of computer time maybe to just uh yeah uh we can do it much faster and then we could mm, not only evaluate a few variants but rather a much higher number of variants and so in this way then if we don't have a reference well it's not that um, important okay so i like to yeah yeah th uh, thank everyone in the group i already said so thank you very much christina and guillem for the great uh work on yeah, on the asterases and the uh, and the tryptophan synthase. Um, uh, of course, the collaborators. Uh, yeah, Reinhard for the very nice collaboration along these years. Also, um, Romas Kaslavskas also for the nice collaboration. Uh, yeah, these institutions, institutions for funding, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'll be happy to ask you uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. We still managed to get it before one. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. So we have time for any questions. questions. So <clears throat> I will make a question if it's a little rush. I can make it very quick. So um, for the simulations, um, you used for different artifact models playing with the depth of the and they say. Asking some, some attempts to generate conformational ensembles from the vendor lab using normal modes plus some sort of you know reweighting. Did you try using conformations derived from normal modes? No. Which is way cheaper. Yeah, no, we haven't tried that. No. And the question I have, which is do you believe the the energy landscape derived from these multiple conformations, conformational points? It's Worse, equally, or better than the long simulation? I mean, do you believe the long simulation is better? And if you would have the time to do it and the composition power, would you stick to these long simulations? Or do you believe that maybe this one is maybe more representative of the real energy? Yeah, the point is that the, the, the ones that I'm comparing, so the gray one uh, was constructed from metadynamic simulation in which we forced, so we, we forced the system, the com domain, to, to explore you know, the, the open, closed, and partially closed conformations. So in a way, it's bias, no? And um, and <laughs> so you never um, and um, and also uh, what I show you here, it's uh, the simulations that we did were ten nanoseconds, but now we have extended it a little bit more, and we are more happy about the results that we get from this, starting from yeah, different starting points and and doing. We have extended up up to five, uh, fifty nanoseconds, which is not that much, but. You see that the the free energy landscape looks like uh pretty pretty convert, so it looks okay. No, um, it's true that um for the metadynamics in the zero v two we have a partially closed that I don't really like that much because it's very deviated from the from the path of structures that we generated. So I'm not sure how good is that partially closed, and this is kind of solved in the in by using this uh, methodology. So this is a strategy. Yeah. Following up on this, uh, in this case, we still had a reference. We still had a, we knew what we were searching. Yes. How, how would we apply all this purely prospective? Will you trust 
safety confirmations coming out of our whole island. There's no <coughs> information on it. Uh, how will you select those confirmations are maybe more relevant? Maybe maybe the ones that stay long in MD could be more relevant, the ones that disappear in MD could be less relevant. Yes. So that's why I think it's it's important to couple it to MD and like different lens mm -hmm. and see how you know how these different yeah confirmation or the starting point that you had that you generate with alpha fold uh, yeah diverse you know from the starting point. Yeah, of course. If we don't have the reference, it's always the the problem, no? But um, but yeah, uh, this is something that we are like now trying. In, uh, but we are excited because really we don't need to do such long MD. Uh, we can discard a lot of variants, no? And and then maybe the ones that we think are more or look more promising, then yeah, explore them better. Let's go for a second question. Sure. Let's go to Mark so, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, the, what about the the new developed new newly published candidates? They are pretty new. So maybe you have some thoughts about the uh, <laughs> statistical folding uh, methods, like the Waffle uh, spectral Eton Munoz Munoz Eton uh, models that, that they show that they can predict the the landscape of folding and the they, they claim that it could have relevance for dynamics in physics. Have you considered maybe to extract some 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 ideas from for the folding models that are statistical only and they are cheap to calculate compared to yeah to throw MD? Honestly, we haven't tried. We haven't uh, either considered it, but it's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think we can we could really get a lot of insight and, and yeah and complementary to that to the tools that we are using. So yeah, why not? Yeah. Hmm. So our ancestral logistics is here. Yeah. Uh, no, because the ancestral reconstruction thing, and then you, I mean, I, I was wondering first because I got a bit lost. Maybe how far in time was this ancestor that you used uh, to compare to the extant protein? Uh, because yeah, now that you have this methodology, alpha fold, and blah, to mm -hmm. do in a couple of hours, the, the, the yeah. short spots. You could use a full trajectory in the phylogenetic tree and see how the path evolves. And then you mm. have a, a guess less differences in this path because you could see some sort of a more continuous change. Mm -hmm. When you consider to do that, I also don't remember if this ancestor you used was experimentally derived, the, 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 if the um, structure was experimental or if it was a model as well. So, so it was a model, but they, they I mean, they did yeah, all the ancestral reconstruction is oh. basically their <clears throat> their work, and basically they they suggested us to work on the ANC three scaffold because experimentally it was also quite good to work with uh, because many of the in some of the nodes they had some yeah some problems, <clears throat> and um and yes I, I think it it would be very interesting to evaluate how along you know evolution these paths uh, change I I completely agree. We haven't, I mean, we have the SPM of the of the ANC3, uh, LPCA, and then the modern ones, but we haven't really computed all of them and, and look at it. We have, what we have done is the, uh, construct the SPM for different uh, tryptophan, modern uh -huh, betas, no? and see how the SPMs differ. And I need to say that um, we have many positions that are quite conserved. Yeah, so they, of course there are differences, but like the, yeah, the, like the, the structure and the core, it's kind of uh, pretty conserved. Yeah. That, that would be really cool if you could, instead of using it and they just use the alpha fold, well, it's not cheap either. Mm. But uh, just do the construction of fold it and, and generate many more ancestors. Just look at, okay, this guy seems that, uh, like a Lyrian is shifted. So let's just yeah. recover the guy and try it without spending time and do anything else, just totally. by prospecting in. Physics. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. Hmm. Maybe single then, points also. I mean, you have your confirmations. Uh, you can do single point narratives. And generate more, no? generate, generate a lot more, yeah. much more deep values. And, and then more, see more statistically, you know, there's some statistical analysis of both. Hmm. Quite fast, yeah. Oh, maybe also. 
It was the only one that they have suggested for more public information. Yeah. Do you think there is anything else? No. For yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, but if you don't need to, yeah. It depends if you don't have to recompute the MSA. And if the view that's coming in a week, no? <laughs> you can do that. More questions? Well, I have a very quick question. Uh, so, or two. So, so all these examples that you show, that you show two, three, four mutants, which has several mutations, it means that you only generated those and you only tried those, not that you generated 10 and then you selected that one. No, we don't. I mean, we don't. We generated um, a few more, but not 10. Eh? I mean, like maybe three or so. It's... And all of them you test with MD and the yeah, one yeah. recovers. The, the, the... I mean, yeah, I mean, experimentally, yeah. Okay. On the computer, we tried. Right? We tried. Yeah, no, in the computer. Ah, in the computer. In the computer, yeah, we, we yeah, generated more, yeah, like 10 or so. 10 or 20 percent. Yes. So. And then the ones that look promising, then we asked okay. to try. And, and then, and then what about expression? Uh, because what we see, we always, you know, oh, wow, this guy is really active in the sovereign atom, but then, you know, express or purification is difficult. You, got, you, you see all this problem. Yeah, um, but I need to say that the first example, the HNL, uh, they are quite robust because the they are conserved somehow. Yes, and and they did like so the Kaslaska did like crazy things like mutating seventy one positions, and the enzyme still falls and and so so they are quite. Um, but yeah, it really depends. No, no. But yeah, I mean, we in some other enzymes, uh, we have had problems. So it really depends. I mean, there are many interesting things that I was particularly passionate about the case of the HMR, the first example. Hmm. Which you, there is a residue in the sequence you were targeting a big different of the family, about the patient, based yeah. on the family for the But this uh, is a little bit. So that's it, yeah. And is it with a K cap? Because you are not into it so bad. K cap or why is it not? The point is that they, of course, we were also curious about no, this particular position. So experimentally, they take they took SAP2 and put at that position the threonine. And the activity of SAP2, it's mm -hmm. yes, it's much, much uh, it's higher than the the 70. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So really, this position has a big effect on uh, on the SAP2 activity as well. Um, and it's in KCAT, yes. Uh, I mean, the the variants that we have that have this, this threonine, the KCAT is better, is mm -hmm. higher. Um, but we think that to get to the SAP2 levels, still there's something else. Mm -hmm. And this something else we think is dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because sub P two, the the histidine aspartate is quite flexible, and the in the HNLs it's like they are like very rigid, and we think this flexibility might be important because for the esterase mechanism is multi step mechanism. So, um, and now our attempts are to try to yeah focus on that region to try to make it uh, the histidine aspartate uh, diet more more flexible. Really interesting to know this. Uh... Why this happening? Why this particular sequence is different from the rest of the population? Yeah. And True. So that's a big experiment. You know? so you, this intuition is right out for some of the reason, compensated by something else, or there's some other things and you're missing. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's very interesting why. But this is not the only case. There are many cases in which there is a single sequence that is different, and in this, I think we even make the connection of this. The full alignment is concerned, and then the key catalytic residue is very close to the catalytic side. And this is very well. Okay, so. different for the rest of the family. Hmm. And uh, at the beginning, we thought there were sequences there, but, but they are not sequences there. They are very different. The case is very different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I didn't know what this case was. Yeah, I mean, we were surprised no? <laughs> that uh, but yeah. Going back to the to this post authentic point again. Uh, so the first if you try these three amino acids that are in the actual site and uh, confuse a little bit and uh, check. But every time you do a mutation and you do your lead, you, you check for the position of the substrate, you check of the catalytic distances, 
that's that's the main driving to move a substrate into the into the but that's those three positions were not included in the maximum technology test as a part. No. No. No, no, because the oxygen iron hole is not well positioned. And, and introducing that single mutation alone, how does the, 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 the computation of the file of the substrate find if you guys did that? Um, alone is not, I mean, so you need to have, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't have it here, but the, so, here in the epistatic uh, story, you know, I show you know, how these three are, are actually needed to put the oxygen iron hole in place. So um, if you introduce only this mutation at position 104, it's, I mean, the activity enhances, but not enough because the oxygen iron hole is not well positioned. So I think the effect of that position of that mutation is completely uh, different uh, or unrelated to the oxygen iron hole reorganization. So you need, yeah, pre-organization, but also, yeah. And now we are, yeah, like working on it and trying to elucidate what this specific mutation is doing uh, because it's not that, um, yeah. What, I, 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 I don't know if you already say that, I mean, what do you do if you do an experiment there, you have a photo of the person that the catalytic diversity is from there, the breaking that they are in the side, should be the other way around. Yes. So, so basically here, so these mutations are affecting the pre-organization of the of the oxygen. So it's putting the the energy of the amide in place. Do you have separate KCAT and KM measurements for this system? Yeah. So what what was it? Well, I, I you would you would guess that the oxygen should increase the KCAT. Also, not the KM. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the, the case. that was not the case. So the KM is is uh, a lot of I mean improved a lot, and we think it's it's yeah KCAT KM no it's always uh, problematic. Um, but the point is that um, so yeah related to maybe I can show you here. So this change this change in the conformation of the side chain of this. Of these uh, oxygen ion hole residue, this affects, of course, the, the KM, the product, because if the side chain is like occupying the space where the substrate needs to fit, then yeah, there's no productive binding. So that's the. Any issues on the same time? Yeah. <laughs> Don't come again. <laughs> We're talking to, to, to repeat that from a local, like looking at the third layer, active side, second layer, and right layer. Let's see whether we we'll get something similar, you know. Hmm. Yeah. What about fish nerves? Are you measuring some value? Trying to predict them? We haven't or we haven't tried. No. <laughs> no, because also, yeah, it's a multi-step mechanism. So yeah, it's basically yeah, yeah. and doing the yeah. but yeah, we have also thought about this. So whether we should, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I know. Support. Support. <laughs> Time for one last question. No, let me go for lunch. Yeah, I'll save mine for later. No? So let's thank you again. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.